Hello and welcome to Jumping Across the Pond and exploring transphobia in a different pop culture place than the US for once. Pretty exciting stuff, huh? That's right, while it might be the same time period, today I want to consider the transphobic roots of an iconic British anti-trans activist, which is the nicest way of saying it, the more realistic way of saying it is hateful bigot who made being transphobic their entire personality to such a degree that it pushed almost everyone who also hasn't made it their entire personality away from them, Graham Linehan. Renowned creator and writer for shows such as Father Ted, Black Books, and the one that people keep begging me to do a video on, The IT Crowd. Now, if you are not either British or a nerd, then you probably don't recognise those too much, but I think they really do represent the British comedy way of approaching minorities that we've discussed in depth with mostly American shows so far. And I wanted to make this more than just an exploration of one episode of the IT crowd, or a couple of comments in Father Ted, because of who wrote them. Because of how iconic Graham Linehan has become in the discourse around the trans debate in the UK, and as a face of the male side of the turf movement, a counterbalance one could say to a person like JK Rowling, who has certainly been a lot luckier in regards to her career and family remaining intact despite everything she says and does and supports. So the big question here that I'm going to try and answer is not what is the trans repetition like in British sitcoms, because it's probably just going to get answered by itself along the way. No. Instead, it's can we see the roots and foundation of the transphobic bigot that Graham Linehan became in his earlier work? Is there a clear and definitive way for us to know that someone is going to end up like he did? I think that's a far more valuable question to answer. It's also good because these British sitcoms last for like a total of 20 to 30 episodes each. So there is not as much to explore or talk about in each one. And I can make a longer video and sort of cover more bases by doing that, you know. All round, I mean, good idea. Now, to start us off, we need to start off slow. With the basic stuff from Graham's early career. Considering the way that queerness is used in his shows like Father Ted and Black Books, which nobody has made any comment on, so is there even anything there at all? So firstly we have Father Ted, a show from the mid-90s, and Jesus Christ that is so long ago, it's almost as old as I am, that is about a group of Catholic priests on an island in Ireland, and their attempts to keep the inhabitants in the fold and to go about doing their duty during a time period when the Catholic faith was getting a little strained due to all those scandals that, if anything, just kept getting worse and worse over the years. Basically, it's a punishment sentence being sent to Craggy Island for these priests, as each one did something that was considered improper for the others or was involved in some incident, although none of it was really that bad except for Father Jack, who is a serial sexual harasser of women and is played off as not such a big deal because he's an old pervert and that's his character. Look, it, it was the 1990s, women were barely people in sitcoms written by men. And when I dug into Father Ted, I kind of hit the problem of there just being barely anything to talk about. And I do sort of see why nobody was asking me to make a video on them. The closest I could find to anything in Father Ted was a comment by a few of the older ladies on the island about watching The Crying Game, where they misgender the trans woman in the film because they thought they were a woman until the scene that revealed they had a penis, which makes them think they're a man. Obviously. We always go on Tuesdays and gets us out of the house. Oh, we saw a great one a few weeks ago, The Crying Game. Oh, it was brilliant. Oh, but there was this great bit in it, you see, there was this girl, and then you find out it's not a girl, but a man. <laughs> and he got his lad out. What? what? Yes, he got his lad out. Well, you only see it for a second, but you get the message. But that by itself isn't too different to other shows from that same time period, and it's two incredibly old people who absolutely would talk like that or think like that about something that they have no familiarity with living on a rural farming island dominated by religion. Perfectly in character, and the show makes no comment itself on that particular insert. We are not, as an audience, directed to see this as behaviour we should emulate. It's just a story about a film that these elderly women saw. In Rockahula Ted... In an attempt to appeal to singer Nam Connolly, a parody of Sinead O'Connor, 
who you might recognise as ripping up a picture of the Pope on SNL and getting basically pariahed for the hot take of thinking that all the bad things the church did was bad and people should be noticing that. Father Ted gets caught up in this weird moment where the singer believes that a couple of dresses are for him midway through his speech about the island being more open-minded and willing to tolerate people's lifestyles. The joke being that it looks like he does cross-dressing. Oh, I don't know, but I like the colour of this one. Oh, I just don't know. <laughs> well, uh, they're both great. I'm sure whichever one you pick, it'll be just lovely. <laughs> Thanks, Ted. <laughs> you see? All sorts of alternative lifestyles catered for. Yet again, not that bad of a joke. And, and yes, it is kind of saying that the humour is him being perceived in a way that he is not, a way that presumably we are meant to think is strange or something that normally you'd be embarrassed by. But coming off of other shows and sitcoms at the same time, it's relatively not that transphobic. Would be a bit weird in a show right now, but hardly equivalent to the sort of vehement vitriolic transphobia one would expect from Graham Linehan. The episode that I assume people would take issue with more often is that of Are You Right There, Father Ted? The classic quotable one wherein Father Ted does an incredibly racist impression of a Chinese person, which gets seen by a Chinese family, and the rumour spreads around the island that he is a racist, which he tries to dispel in many failing ways as bad luck keeps catching up with him, and making him look like Hitler, or having a bunch of Nazi memorabilia around the house, or Father Jack dressed up in an SS uniform. It's well known for its scene involving a parishioner asking Ted, So here you're a racist now, Father? To which the answer is... kind of, sort of, yes? I hear you're a racist now, Father! <laughs> What? How did you get interested in that type of thing? You said I'm a racist. Everyone's saying it, Father. Like, the whole episode is dedicated to this idea that Father Ted is not really a racist. He was just making a silly little foolish caricature that got taken poorly. And then he kept getting taken out of context and misinterpreted. But at its core, yeah, he was doing a racism. And the failure to acknowledge what that represents, and what it encourages in his flock, is a major character flaw. Actually seeing that story from that lens does make me think if that's how Graham Linehan sort of sees himself. Just someone who got criticised too harshly one time, and then kept getting ragged on by people for all these things that were taken wildly away from their intended meaning, and so he had to begin openly attacking trans people all over the internet, directing hate towards them, and joking about killing them, posting private pictures of their genitals to the public as part of mocking them. Yeah, surely he must think he is still the good guy, or he'd be having some kind of horrifying revelation or epiphany right now about what he has done and where it has led him. Like that Nazi skit from Mitchell and Webb. Have you noticed that our caps have actually got little pictures of skulls on them? <laughs> I don't, so... Hands. Are we the baddies? Anyways, Black Books comes to us a little later, starting two years after Father Ted ended in 2000, and running for another four years because British TV either ends so soon or drags on forever like Doctor Who or Coronation Street. I don't want to waste your time too much here on something that is even less relevant than Father Ted to understanding Graham Linehan, because there is basically nothing tied to trans people much at all. There are some queer jokes, I can think of one from Grapes of Wrath, where Fran believes that her date is actually gay, because he seems too effeminate to be straight, which ends up kind of coming around to punish her in the karmic sense. I mean, a lot of black books is bad people being shitty and getting punished for it. The main characters remind me a lot of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia in that regard. But yeah, there is no foundational transphobia or homophobia here to really build a strong case for the question that we're trying to answer. And so, why waste time here when we can jump straight to the meat of the discussion? And so we do jump forward another few years to the IT crap of which there are a few elements that bear some mentioning, like the gay jokes that are made during Are We Not Men, 
where Moss begins forcibly kissing Roy as part of a ploy to avoid the police's suspicion for a robbery, and the work outing, which features Jen dating a guy named Philip, who everybody is sure is gay due to them doing a whole bunch of queer stuff like not kissing women or going to see a gay musical called Gay, though it's 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 bloody hard to find non gay musicals, so come on, that's that's barely a rainbow flag at all, and owning a gay magazine. All of which comes together with him admitting that he is gay, yes, and that he thought it could work with Jen because she looks kind of like a man. It's very lowbrow humour from the show and sort of one of its weakest episodes, honestly, and it is interesting that Graham Linehan would go to this watering hole of a guy being suspected to be gay by a woman they're on a date with twice. Odd that it happened more than once, though you could blame that on unoriginality, or you could blame it on the fact that Graham thinks this shit is hilarious. But those are the weak episodes for any kind of argument or attempt to get some background slash introspection on Graham Linehan as a person. No, 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 there's only one real essential that I want to consider, and to analyse more in depth for the thesis of this video essay, and that is the explicit trans episode itself, the speech which has an actual trans character, and wherein the transness of that person is important and central to the secondary plot of the episode, and the jokes made therein. So it all begins when Douglas Renom, played by the incomparable Matt Berry, a favourite actor of mine and thespian whose comedic stylings lend this strange, ridiculous gravitas to the characters that they play, who are often turned into these crazed versions of people anyway by the plot, and which he very much hams up is interviewed by April Sheffield about his role as incredibly rich person and CEO of Renault Industries, which leads to a date as April is attractive and Douglas is a, as he's a bloody hound he is, he will go after women on a regular basis, sometimes in creepy ways that involve roofies. Yeah, that's another one of those IT crowd episodes that aged really poorly, plot lines where Rohypnol is used to comedic effect by male comedy writers. Yikes. But back to the episode at hand, it takes April out on a date, only for her to reveal during it that she used to be a man, as Douglas is so hyper-focused on the having of sex. However, thanks to some issues on Douglas's end, he hears her as saying that she used to be from Iran. Not. I've had a lot of hormone therapy and a number of operations. I'm really sorry, I, I hope you don't feel I deceived you. I understand if, if you would rather I left. I don't care. Also, there are some weird laughs played when she reveals that she used to be a man, uh, first hintings towards some transphobia. The idea that the very notion of this revelation is a joke for the laugh track to play around. Remember that laugh tracks are used by sitcoms to direct the audience when comedy is happening. They tell you from the writers themselves, here is where you should be thinking there is a joke. But thanks to that mishearing, Douglas is okay with the idea not seeing an issue with dating someone who used to be from Iran, which to April makes him seem very progressive in comparison to the many men who have an issue of her being transgender. The many men who in the future will end up including Graham Linehan himself. Now, the activities that they get up to do kind of try to make April seem mannish, try to imply some inherent manliness because of what she is talented at or comfortable doing, like drinking beers or arm wrestling. Because comedy is the lowest common denominator of laziness when it comes to minorities. But this is all just played as kind of sexy to Douglas. So, heck, you know, whatever works, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, this all comes to a head when Douglas reveals that he's really enjoyed the day spent with April, expressing how it seems strange as he normally flees right after he ejaculates in a woman, but something seems different about her, about this, like there's some kind of inherent relationship difference with dating a trans woman, and a woman that a poonhound's dick like the one Douglas has can tell the masculine energy difference of. Yeah, you can sort of sense the essentialism at play here, an essentialism that absolutely exists in many of our franchises around gendered groups, or transgender identities because they were written by cis men who didn't bother thinking about or expanding their horizons on that front in regards to research or understanding. But the two reveal that they love each other, and everything seems pretty good and great, until Douglas also reveals that he thought she said Iran, and not a man, 
which April then swiftly corrects, to Douglas's great chagrin and horror. Douglas then freaks out and lets the fear of this discovery take over his affection that he showed, which then ends with him breaking up with her over it. Him trying his best to make it clear that it isn't because she's transgender, but it also been very clear at the same time that it is because of that, as April begs him to reconsider, declaring that she is a woman. It's honestly kind of heartbreaking, right up until April punches him in the face, which leads to an all-out brawl in the Renom Labs, violence of a sort which is I guess more okay from Douglas because we know that April is transgender. Finally, the episode ends with Douglas staring at the article that April wrote on him, calling him an asshole, and he starts crying when he realises that it's not the same without April, that he made the wrong choice, and that he misses April to the raucous cacophony of the laugh track. But it's not the same! And that's the episode. Now, this might be a weird take on all of this, one that might come as a shock to a few of you, but I don't think this is that bad. The laugh track and the places in which it is placed, the way that April is positioned as being masculine through her hobbies, and some of the violence from her towards Douglas is certainly something that definitely reflects transphobic attitudes or subconscious bigotry. But in a more general sense, this is not that much of a transphobic episode. The general theme of Douglas is that he is a bad guy, who is not someone we should like. Every episode is him doing another scheme or terrible thing like that Rufy shit, and the ending of him realising his screw up over April does quite show this attitude that his own bigotry ruined one of the best relationships he had ever had with a woman. This would be quite the tale if it was separated from the sitcom setting that it's shoved into, and I certainly think that it's a far more sympathetic portrayal of a trans woman than in other shows like How I Met Your Mother or South Park. I know this isn't what people want me to say. People don't want me to conclude that something Graham Linehan did and wrote, something that is created by such a reviled transphobe, doesn't really reflect that much of a transphobia or at least nowhere near as much as their current stance does. But that's just the facts. It's somewhat accurate, it doesn't make April out to meet herself anything more than confident in who she is. She isn't tricking Douglas, in fact she openly reveals it to him before they sleep together on the date. And the resolution is that Douglas screwed up. Oh, and she's also played by Lucy Montgomery, a cis woman, who as we have covered is not as great as having a trans woman played by a trans woman, but is still leagues better in what it says and portrays than having them played by a cis man. So, that's the episode, and that's IT Crowd. Which brings us around to answering that big question, the one that started us down this road. The question that I am totally not stalling for time here, as I try and remember desperately what the hell it was that I wrote. Uh, Right, the question of if we could use Graham Linhan's past to discover the secrets to why he became one of the supervillains of the trans community in the UK, and willingly destroyed his own life over his obsession with anti-trans activism, to the degree that his career got nuked and his wife left him taking the kids. Why have you got yourself mired in this? You're not a trans person, you're not a woman, why have you made this your issue? Uh, Well, the main reason is that women can't speak about this. Um, uh, uh, Women like... I'll admit, I'm not a great person to be in this conversation. I'm a comedy writer. And based on what we've discussed, what we've seen through Father Ted and Black Books and IT Crowd, I really don't think we can. While there are certainly uncomfortable moments in those comedies, jokes that don't really land, problematic content that targets minorities in a way that doesn't really say the progressive message that might have been intended, the overall theme is one that matches many other comedians and writers of the same time period. Many who went on to not become avid turfs, and in fact tried to do better, 
like Seth MacFarlane, who initially responded poorly to the criticisms of trans representation in Family Guy, but has since included a pretty respectful and well-written piece of trans representation within the Orville. And what Graham Linehan wrote and created was nowhere near as openly toxic or vile as what Seth MacFarlane did. And yet, one of them spiralled further and further into transphobia in response to criticism. If anything, Graham Linehan's career doesn't give us clues towards how he ended up. It doesn't give us a clear framework for warning signs and red flags. Or, at least, it doesn't give us that for searching people's past history in their content creation. While Graham's work might not be the solution to that question, the answer that we're searching for, It does mean, and it does encourage us, to look elsewhere, because the transphobic roots are not there. An essential thing to understand about Graham Linehan is how much of his story mirrors another famous anti-trans celebrity, one who far outweighs him in wealth and fame and the protections afforded by that status, J.K. Rowling because both of them dealt with the same thing at different times, namely that they faced backlash and criticism from people for transphobia in their writings or actions. For Graham Linehan, it was when the speech was rerun on TV in 2013, and was subsequently pulled after outrage about the transphobic elements that were present in it, transphobic elements that Graham denied and denied were indicative of any kind of transphobia in himself, which is a dangerous position to take. You should always be introspective about the bigotries that you might have that you don't recognise. That's the best way to evolve and change the person. If you think that you're perfect and fine and there's nothing wrong with you, that's more worrying. For J.K. Rowling, it was when she had her middle-aged moment of liking a turf tweet that was defending a turf for making her workplace a hostile environment for trans employees and trans customers. In both cases, the parties involved refused to see what they did as a problem, and because they didn't see the issue with their behaviour, or downplayed it, and didn't see it as really a proper reflection of their attitudes, the criticism of them came off as hatred and vindictive, more than constructive. But, unlike Seth MacFarlane, rather than just cooling down and stepping away from the trans topic or issue for a bit, instead both were courted by Terse due to this backlash. A great video to check out about this is Kaylin Conrad's series about TERFs and their recruitment habits, and it's very fascinating to consider it in regards to its relation to both cults and online alt-right groups. Both find those who've been isolated via some event during their life that caused them to feel attacked or hurt, and then they loved bombed them, or engaged in positively propping them up, telling them that they weren't wrong, that in fact it was the haters who were wrong, and also here are more studies and surveys and content taken out of context that reassure the points or fears that you expressed, and in fact inflame them, in fact encourage worse ideas. They are courted and coaxed, and it works especially well when your ego has been hurt by your identity being called into question. In this case, both Graham Linehan and J.K. Rowling's allyship or stance of the queer community from trans people. And with that pushing, with that support from people who are enabling the worst attitudes that you have, because they see you as a target to obtain for their movement, you slip up again. You say something else transphobic, and the backlash gets bigger, which leads to more positivity from those groups encouraging you. It's like this perfect feedback cycle, where nobody likes to hear negative things about themselves, nobody likes to take criticism, especially when they think they're in the right, and so they start self-isolating, listening more and more to the people who only affirm them, who provide no counterpoints at all, and dismissing all the voices in contrast as haters, or the enemy, or part of the problem, or bought figures, or in some big conspiracy, or secret puppeteering, or tricked by something behind the scenes. Whatever it is, all those people against you are villains and victims and not worth your time. And so you keep posting things, you keep saying and doing the stuff that gets the group who have your back to cheer for you. And damn the consequences, because everyone likes having cheerleaders who do their best to shield you from considering the criticism levied at you. And eventually, after you're isolated from anyone with a difference in opinion, when you've ruined your image and who you are to the point that the only group that will accept you is that group, then you have no way to go back. 
at that point, you're suckered in and there's no escape. Whatever that group wants to become your life becomes your life, becomes your new identity. Your wife could leave you. Your bosses and your co-workers could stop engaging with you. Your friends and the people you used to love could walk away. And you would just think they've been compromised. That they're too scared to speak the truth. The scary thing about the Graham Linehan story and the J.K. Rowling one by proxy is not that he was always this massive transphobe and that was where he was going to end up is as clear as day, but that it wasn't always obvious. That he could have gone a very different direction, but that this honestly pretty normal comedy writer who was kind of progressive, but not really that progressive, like a lot of cis straight white men, you know, they, they vote left, but they don't really care about all the minorities enough to try and get involved in understanding them at a ground level. This man was transformed by a group of people who came to his side to use him in the long term as a celebrity for their movement into an aggressive and unrecognisable extremist whose hatred of trans people dwarves any other part of who he used to be. But has, has stepping in made the debate any better? I mean, a lot of people say that the language you've used, some of the dismissive terms that you've bandied about have actually increased the toxicity of this C debate. Can you give me an example? Yes, you can... You, yeah, I'll, I'll give you several if you want. <laughs> so, um, what about comparing people in the trans debate to speaking out against Nazis? I mean, that's pretty extreme. Well... There's a couple of parallels. One is that at the moment, um, children are uh, basically being experimented on with uh, uh, puberty blockers. Uh, for instance... Oh, you're... come on. You're not seriously trying to say that children going to the doctor and saying that they're worried about their gender is akin to children being experimented on in Nazi I, I'm concentration afraid, I'm, camps? I'm afraid I am. It's like he got hit by that oil from Prometheus. Wait, nobody watched that. Um... It's like he got hit by that oil from Phyrexia. Wait, that's not a universal pop culture reference either. Think, 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 I just watched so much. Um, it's like he got noughted by Xenonaut. Yeah, everyone knows that one. And that, I think, is the true lesson here. The true thing to take away. A lot of people, regular people with basic flaws and subconscious bigotries, can very easily be targeted and pushed into signing up for these groups. Well, they end up thinking they've become part of a trans war, and they lose all ties to reality and to having an identity outside of that. It could happen to almost everybody, and there is no clear way of seeing it until the problems start popping up, until a person starts taking criticism the wrong way, and having it be used to slowly twist them into echo chambers that reflect the worst parts of them back at themselves for encouragement. <laughs> So that's the big conclusion to the question, that Graham Linehan and who he became is not so easily read within the work that he did, and it's more of a reflection of the darker path that one can take when faced with criticism for the actions or writing that you engaged with. I think it's important to remember that, because it would be easier to act as if he was always this transphobic, that all the stuff that he ever made is filled with who he is right now, and not that the comedy he did is mostly fine. A little bit low-hanging, and a little bit sometimes making bad episodes filled with very, very awkward comedy, like that time that they made fun of a man getting sexually harassed. Yeah, that that's an IT Crowd episode that honestly should be way more remembered for how terrible it was than the trans one. Liking the IT Crowd, or Black Books, or Father Ted, doesn't make you a transphobe, like Graham Linehan, because those shows themselves didn't make him a transphobe. The criticism of him didn't make him a transphobe either. It was his own choices and the encouragement of transphobic groups who wanted to recruit him into their own personal war, funded by right-wing organisations out of America, that pushed Graham Linehan to be who he is today. And the person who has been most punished for those choices is, is actually, it's kind of a toss-up between the trans women that he harasses and directs hate towards to the cheers of the frankly vile and blood-baying crowd that he has become inextricably linked to and Graham himself. Because he killed his career. He killed his marriage. He has become like Douglas Renholm at the end of the speech. A sad man crying in his bed alone, forced into this by the bigotry that he allowed to ruin the good things in his life. Don't be like Graham. 
And also, keep your eyes peeled for when a celebrity starts having the same thing happen, when they get criticised and immediately surrounded by sycophants who support everything they say and push them to say even more bigoted stuff and protect their ego from any tarnishing. Because that's how it starts. Anyway, I hope you learned something from this video or that you enjoyed what you watched. If you are Graham himself, like, dude, it's, it's never too late to change. It's never too late to realise that what you're doing is madness, that you've been consumed by hatred for a single group to an unhealthy level. I'm not even saying here that you've got to flip to being pro-trans. Just get different hobbies. Unlink yourself from those turf groups for a bit and try and live a life outside of that frankly cult that has taken over. I don't know if you'll listen, and actually knowing what I know about cults, you probably won't because that's part of how they work. I mean, look at Scientology. I want to make it very clear here that Scientology is not a cult? Can they actually get me? They are a cult. They're a horrifying cult that I think has been involved in the cover-up of, like, murders and stuff. So, you know, screw Scientology as well as, you know, the turfs. But, look, to, look, Graham, give it a shot. For a few months. Not for me. Not for the trans people of the UK. Well, that would help a lot. But for yourself. Just see what it's like. Just take a step back. Don't think about. Don't engage with. Don't look at anything that's linked to the trans issue or whatever, or debate, or whatever you want to call it. Step back from the trans war. Just, you know, try and be yourself again? Because maybe the wife will come back. Regardless, if you really like what I've done and want to do more than just liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting about how this channel deserves more views, because I get it, I, I also think I deserve more views too then you can support me financially by going to my Patreon or Ko-Fi. It's really valuable for helping me to pay for the essentials of living, the essentials that allow me to make these videos at such an alarming rate without having to worry about food, housing, electricity. All the things that I need to be able to keep fighting the trans war on the trenches. Grrr. The names of those who do support me and support the right side during this brutal combat should be flying past the screen right now. God bless these brave warriors for their contributions to the effort, and I cannot keep this bit up, because it's ridiculous to refer to it like this. It's ridiculous to call it a trans war, it's almost as bad as calling it the trans debate. Like, what kind of imagery are we trying to evoke here? One that makes trans people into literally, like, enemies, or into something that we can, like, toss words over and around? Anyway, thank you for watching this video, and I hope you have a great day. Even you, Graham. I hope that you have a great day away from Twitter. Just step back for a bit. Don't look at any of that stuff. Just just go outside. Go hang out with some friends that aren't going to just talk to you about only trans stuff. Go hang out with other friends. Get into something like Magic the Gathering. It's a fun hobby. There's also turfs in that too, so you can collect some turf cards as well. God, you just can't get away from it, can you?